So I grew up during the 60s when civil rights and, you know, there were fights and, you know, dogs and, you know, mistreatment as far as for trying to just be like everybody else, just have what everybody else, the American dream, supposedly. We got to where we were going and in the front yard, a cross was still smoldering. And my uncle that lived there was telling us about the night before, where he actually came out of his house with his shotgun because the Klan had, had gathered in front of his house. He said he walked backwards to the cross and knocked it over. And I said, leave him alone. He hasn't done anything. And the next thing I know, the police officer pulled the gun out, stuck it in my face, and said, say one more word, and I'm gonna blow your head off. Uh, that was welcome to High Point to me. I am born and raised at High Point, High Point native, uh, family in High Point, parents reside in High Point, uh, sister, two brothers, so we are High Points. I have, you know, like all of us, there's always the occasion where we are profiled for being black. And I do recall, even as a young child, being followed in stores or being told not to go into certain areas. Um, being a child of the 70s, my folks uh, integrated a neighborhood that was predominantly white and we had incidents with our neighbors where the neighbors would come out and call my dad and try to start things with the family. So it was very uncomfortable um, being in that type of environment, obviously, um, yet my parents persevered. Uh, they knew the importance of education. Um, they instilled on us uh, the belief that we can do what we want to do when we are educated and are informed. And that's basically what uh, formed my, my childhood. I grew up in rural North Carolina. Uh, it was a one-stop light town. Uh, I grew up in the 60s. And my experience early on was having to walk down the back alleys in order to get into the department stores. And once you were in the department stores, uh, you only were allowed to uh, shop in the area that was designated colored. Um, even when shopping for school clothes, there was no uh, dressing room for colored people. So I remember distinctly ladies that, or black ladies that were in the store would actually hold up blankets in the corner of the store so that uh, the kids could, could change and try on the clothes that, that they were looking at. And once you tried those clothes on, those clothes never went out front. They all stayed in the back, you know, because we tried them on. I was in fifth grade. Uh, growing up, one of the few kids, uh, black kids in my school, uh, I was put forth for, and I'm dating myself here, it's called GT or uh, AG classes, uh, gifted and talented or academically uh, gifted kids. And I was um, suggested by one of the teacher's aides that um, I be in that, in that group. So took the test, passed the test, um, and I got in ahead of some, some other white kids. And I was really proud, my mom was really proud. Um, but then um, some parents protested because I got in ahead of their kid. And they thought I received some type of special treatment or coaching or whatever it is. And I remember having to retake the test with those parents there watching me take that test again. And that was the moment that as a 10 year old crystallized to me how different life is for black people in this country. Um, 
my own merits, my work, my intellect was so easily challenged by people just because I scored a little bit better than their kid. The expectation of me was so low that it was unbelievable that I could be smart. So, so yeah, that is, I've carried that with me every day and how I approach life, how I, um, how I raise my kids, how I push them to be better, um, because they're not going to be valued. Um, and I hope that changes. They're, but every achievement, um, someone's going to question it simply because of the color of our skin. And that was hard to deal with and um, having to, to fight through that and not um, be cynical and not to bear hatred for people because I was treated that way. Um, you know, uh, along the lines, I've had some really great mentors who are white, coaches who have, who have helped me to reach the points that I've reached in my life. But I've never lost sight of that moment to let folks know that there, you know, that there are differences, there are challenges, simply because I'm a different race than the majority of people in this country. In America, we are not taught our true, who we really are. So early memories of being treated black are just everyday memories. Going to the grocery store, being followed around, um, just the friends that we have. You know, people start out very innocent. I went to um, Christ the King right up here at um, High Point, Christ the King right across the tracks. Um, and just the point that I, I guess I was in a bubble because I was always surrounded around many blacks, but then the white kids that did go there, they may say, oh, we like you even though, or you're not like them. Well, that's not a compliment. And you think that's a compliment until you really start in older age and you start really recognizing that those are hurtful words. Those aren't words of endearment. Those are words of separation. I came here in 57, 58. My, my husband, after he got out of service, he found a job here, so we moved here from Anson County. When I came, we was just getting started thinking about having a family, but I wanted to work. I started going to the unemployment office. I remember the guy's name, uh, Mr. Stewart. He worked there, he's dead now. Uh, he sent me out various places. I mean, they got a way of interviewing you and making you think you're really getting places. But then at the end, they'll say, well, we're not hiring today. And I did that several times, uh, more than one or two weeks. And that's when he found out that they were hiring the whites that he sent there, but was not hiring the blacks. There were a lot of instances that, uh, that I experienced when I was growing up. Uh, and for the sake of time, I won't go into all of them, but one, one thing that happened that really impacted my life was that my family was traveling, and again, through rural North Carolina, and we stopped at a service station because, you know, I had to use the bathroom, you know. Now, mind you, I'm eight years old at this time. We get out, my sister and I, who's three years younger than, than me, my sister, my grandmother, and I went into the service station and my grandmother asked for the key to the restroom. She was given the key. We went out to the restroom. She put the key in the, in the locks and it wouldn't open. So, um, she, and she tried the women's bathroom. So she said, okay, let's, let's try the men's. So she tried the men's restroom and it didn't open. And I distinctly remember my grandmother saying, wait a minute, 
we stepped around the building and there were two outhouses and the key fit the padlock of the outhouses. She went back in and she threw the key at, at the service station owner and we left. We got to where we were going and in the front yard, a cross was still smoldering. And my uncle that lived there was telling us about the night before where he actually came out of his house with his shotgun because the Klan had, had gathered in front of his house. He said he walked backwards to the cross and knocked it over, you know. See, stories like that just, it, they, they stay with you forever. See, I had two lives because of the color of my skin. We used to go to the Paramount Theater. Quite naturally, we had to sit in the balcony. And sometimes I'd be walking back from the south side and I want to go in the movie. I was on the uh, black side uh, going in and he said, boy, you better come on over here. Well, you belong over there with them. He assumed that I was, black. I was supposed to be over with the white people. I never forgot that. And I found out that the more I was around, the more I experienced it. Like down at the parade, you're enjoying the parade downtown, the Christmas parade, and somebody says, when is the parade uh, uh, band coming? I'm waiting on the niggers. You know, there's nothing you can do. You look around and there are 50 white people and a couple of black people. So what are you going to do? So, um, and my grandmother, my step-grandmother, was a very dark lady. Uh, she was in uh, Big Bear Supermarket once, and she had all these car chavers and Aunt Enemy and all of them, all these light bright, these different color eyes. They thought she was a maid from Emerywood. And she told one of them to quit messing with something, and she hauled out and popped him on the hand. And she got arrested for striking a white child. Our teachers, they sent us these books from Central. When Central got new books, we got their books. And you'd open it up. Enjoy this book. Do you know how to read? Written in these books. But our teachers taught us, don't let that get you down. You're not an... Look in the mirror. My grandmother taught me that. She's, she'd take me and stand me in front of that mirror. Don't you ever leave this house thinking that you're ugly. Don't you ever leave this house thinking you're dumb. Well, I was a student at Fable State University, and um, some members of the Winston-Salem Black Panther Party came through and actually recruited me. I left Fable State and I came to Winston-Salem. I was in Winston-Salem for a while and rose up through the ranks and, and then uh, they asked me to come to High Point that we can begin some work over here at High Point, help the community. In fact, we had 66 survival programs. We had free breakfast programs. We had pest control programs. Uh, we had free health clinics. Uh, we had uh, uh, liberation schools for, for the children. Uh, we, did, we did so much. We had a free ambulance service. Uh, because black people couldn't get an ambulance. Uh, the ambulance wouldn't come, or you couldn't afford, you had to pay before you got in the ambulance. And so you, they couldn't afford it. And so we started a free ambulance service in Winston-Salem, and uh, it was not just for black people, it was for anybody that called. Because of racism, discrimination, uh, black people, and that continues today, uh, this disparity in health care uh, was, was very pre prevalent at that time, uh, and so we had to take care of ourselves. A dollar and a half a day, and it's time to stop. Like right now, you got the power. You got the power. The power is belongs to the politicians. The power belongs to those people who are uh, in D.C. But we, as a people, and it's white, brown, black, we don't have any power. We don't have a say. And so when we're saying black power, uh, one of the things that, 
that we were very well aware of is that we had no power. Uh, we had to fight to vote. I remember as a, as a young child, now you telling me I'm in a country and I'm free, but we can't vote. Uh, it's not that we didn't, not that there was a law against us voting, but we were living in a, in a, a racist society uh, so, uh, where white supremacy ruled. And there were all kinds of things that kept us away from the polls, even if it meant cross burnings. Uh, and, and like I said, I grew up in, in the eastern part of North Carolina and I experienced cross burnings, uh, Klan. I remember a time uh, my mother was involved in uh, civil rights. So she introduced me to, to all of that. She would take my brother and I when um, uh, the NAACP would meet and they would, they would plan and they, would, they were training people for nonviolence. Uh, and she would take my brother and I, he's two years older than me. Talking about was the possibility of spending your Christmas in jail. I think the most beautiful thing that we could do would be to stage a mass sit-in or some type of demonstration. And if they did not serve us, to remain until they served us. If arrested, to go in jail and refuse bail. That's what I think will um, have a, a much larger impact than just mere arrest. I'd like to hear your comments on it and see exactly what you think and how you feel about it. She took us to... Uh uh, uh, it was going to be a demonstration. It was going to be a march uh, to desegregate uh, the schools over there. And uh, they met at the church, and they gave everybody the instructions. You know, if you, you know, if you can't uh, uh, be nonviolent, if somebody spits on you or throws something at you, you've got to, you know, be nonviolent. And if you can't do that, you can't march. And uh, after giving all the instructions and, and everybody was explained the route they were gonna take and all of that, they were expecting the Klan to be there. The Klan uh, had found out about it, they knew about it, and they were expecting the Klan to be there. And so what they decided was they were gonna leave all the little children in the church where we would be safe. Uh, but she did take my brother with her. So I'm in the church with, with, with other little kids. I'm probably about uh, nine or 10 years old. Uh, and uh, we're at the church and the Klan did come, but they didn't come to the march. They came to the church. And so they shot up a church full of little children. And I remember hiding under the pew, trying not to be shot. Well, then when the news got to the marchers and they heard of, well, the march, the whole march, everything stopped then and, and, and parents are rushing back to the church to check on, check on their kids, you know, and, but, and I was safe, but I was scared. This is, you know, to, to have to hide under a pew as a, as a little kid, you know, while Klansmen are standing outside the building shooting into the church. That's, uh, that's another early memory that I have of, of, of racism. I think it's important to look to our past to better understand how to move forward. It's sort of an old adage, but in some ways, trees are stronger if their roots are grounded well. And I think that the work that, that we're trying to do together, uh, and there's many, many people involved, is to try to get to some of the core issues that are plaguing the city in terms of the, the discrepancies, in terms of wealth, health, uh, wellness of people of, of African descent, African Americans, versus other communities. And this is something that's not just relevant to this city, but to the region, the state, and indeed the nation. I was tasked to look at the broader history of African Americans in North Carolina obviously with attention to High Point, but really taking the, the story back to the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the enslavement of Africans and African Americans, and taking that story through the era of Jim Crow. And so I was to provide an overview of this history and really 
help people see um, the, the ways in which uh, institutional forms of racism have been carried out over centuries. And so this is not something that's just recent. It's not even a 20th century phenomenon. It goes back literally to the 17th century, at least. My role on the project was one of the content experts, particularly to explore the actions of the High Point City Council since 1960 and their effect on um, particularly black communities in the city. The work of the One High Point Commission is important um, because it is addressing issues that have needed to address for um, decades, if not a century and a half. Yeah, so the history of urban renewal in the United States is interesting, um, and particularly in the South, where you already had um, you know, larger communities of, of disenfranchised and, and, and marginalized African Americans, and particularly um, ADOS, American descendants of slavery. And so being um, ADOS made it one, much harder uh, to establish generational wealth, what we know as the generational wealth. And so then when you go in and you have an urban renewal project that largely decimates black communities, that makes that accumulation of generational wealth virtually impossible. Not only that, but you are, you know, they were actively demolishing people's homes without giving them really the means or the resources to be able to go out and buy new homes. So they embarked on more construction of um, public housing. But then do you keep up with that public housing? Does the city keep up with that public housing? And so it affects, you know, generations uh, going forward who don't have access to, you, things like home ownership, um, but also the urban renewal projects around the country further spurred that white flight. So it further spurred, you know, the move of white people in High Point to places like Emorywood or other suburbs, leaving a concentration of marginalized black people in the city center, in this case in High Point, in the East Central area. And so that affects jobs, that affects education. And so, if you're driving through High Point today and you're driving through the East Central neighborhood and then you, you know, go a few miles over and you go over to Emory Wood and you're like, wow, this is um, not only a drastic change, but an enraging one. There were petitions to the High Point City Council, um, I remember particularly for a pool um, and I think a drive to Emorywood Country Club, which I believe is now High Point Country Club. Um, at the same time, you know, in, in the same meeting, they might be talking about, you know, how there is not enough new housing, new public housing to go around to house the people who have been displaced from urban renewal or they're talking about, um, you know, putting, you know, just getting sewer lines to certain communities. And so you have one end of town that is advocating for their country club, and one is just advocating for clean water. You know, the commission was, was a brainchild of the High Point NAACP. The thing that brought me to High Point is my life because this is where I'm from. My family, uh, my cousins, everyone that has sustained my life, all my life, are from the High Point area, High Point, Jamestown. And we live here, we work here, we have our families here. This is home. They met with the city and again, we have the right council in place that was actually listening to that, that request. Council uh, uh, picked up the ball and, and created the commission to just research the various areas of, um, I would say, disparities in High Point and come up with a recommendation for City Council that would hopefully correct some of those disparities, knowing that this is just the first step. The One High Point Commission was formed um, out of, a, uh, I don't want to say desperation, but from a very uh, deep place of need. Um, you know, there are so many things that often go 
um, that happen in cities, that happen in um, development, that um, people, if they don't have a voice, they, they seem to get left out. Um, and then every time something happens, uh, a, a disaster, a pandemic, or whatever it may be, uh, if you're already in need, those needs get exacerbated. Uh, you know, we talk about how um, the, the pandemic affected minority businesses. So many of them, 90% that closed will never reopen. Uh, and so when we talk about showing up and giving the uh, opportunity, the equality of opportunity um, to, to, to neighborhoods and to people, um, when that historically has been denied, then we have to think about equity. So many different policies uh, were put in place that um, caused disparate impact on those communities. So the leaders of the black community came forward and said, hey, you know, these are the things that have negatively impacted how we live. You know, we have, um, you know, in our in, in community, some of the most food insecure, um, some of the, you know, lowest median incomes, shorter life expectancies. Um, you know, the difference between 27260 and 27265 life expectancy, expectancy is 17 years. How is that possible for a distance of less than 10 miles apart? How can that be possible? How can it be? How can we allow it? Um, and I think that's one of the things that as you go on, if you don't address these problems, they become generational burdens to people who have, through no fault of their own, just been born into these areas. What I hope to achieve by sitting on this commission is the opportunity to pave the way for those who have been disenfranchised and left out to have accessibility to the generational wealth that resides here in this city and the ability to be landowners, homeowners, and business owners as well as entrepreneurs that understanding that generational wealth is passed down because there is property and land and an actual um, business that can be, be passed on from generation to generation that individuals are able to say, I, I'm the fourth generation, I'm the fifth generation, and then there's a sustainable model to that wealth and to that, that land ownership. The work of the One High Point Commission is very important. Um, the reason is we're all human beings. We're all created by God. Um, and if we believe that we're all supposed to be equal, which is, you know, what our Constitution says, then why can't we be treated equally? The work of the high point, One High Point Commission, I think is definitely overdue. Um, high Point has needed that for some time, okay? It's one thing to know that there are issues. It's another thing to have someone who doesn't live here in High Point come and do the research and they can tell you that yes, there are issues, there were issues, there still are issues in in our races, okay? Uh, if we're going to move up, can we move up together, all races? Not one move up, one move down. And I think the importance of this One High Point Commission, it brings it out for those people who doubted it or those people who thought that there was not an issue to see that there is actually an issue. We have data we have information to back up what we've been saying all along. There are many different schools of thought on how to do reparations. I'm of the belief that it is true that only the federal government can properly do cash-based reparations. A local government has a number of restraints in terms of their actual budget and how they would make decisions about who is eligible for reparations. Restorative policies will target the same group of people without running afoul of any kind of laws or other issues with targeting specifically African Americans. It's policy that got us to the point at which we are, and it's going to be policy that gets us to where we need to be. And the most compelling thing about policy, policy is not only going to be effectively uh, uh, impacting the black community, that policy is going to infect the entire community. 
to the critics, I say, this work continues. Uh, to those that are supporting us, we need your, uh, we need stronger support and warm bodies. Uh, but before I go any further, I want to make sure that everyone knows the commissioners that have worked on this project are, were extremely dedicated to it. And those that chose the commissioners to work on this project did an excellent job um, choosing uh, those that, that are a part. Uh, each one of them brought a unique skill set to the commission. I think the finished product is going to be something that uh, everybody will agree with as, as we present it to, to uh, the public. A year and a half has passed and we have actually done it. We have actually